Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Before I explore the question of whether a bee could be said to have a mind, I would like to thank my co-authors that have helped me form all the thoughts and experiments that I'm about to tell you about. And they are Catherine Wilson, Quinn Solvi, Oli Lukola, and Peter Skorupski. So what I'd like to explore today is whether from what we know about B spatial cognition, we can make inferences about the question of whether bees or other insects are conscious. So what I mean by that is that there is some form of mental representation of things, of space, and of things in space. I also want to explore whether bees in the context of spatial cognition have an appreciative appreciation of the outcomes of their own actions and their spatial problem-solving tasks, and whether there might be emotional states that are linked to spatial settings. So there is a common perception that while people realize that insects can do very complex things, that they do them by means wholly different from how humans solve them. So here is something that at first glance maybe shows a similar outcome, the um, famous La Sagrada Familia Cathedral in Barcelona and a large termite construction roughly of a similar shape. And the common perception is that in the human architecture case there is a master plan, a plan for how the ultimate outcome should look, and then all the other actions are subordinate to that plan, whereas in insects everything arises by local interactions um, where no one has any idea of what the ultimate product should look like. And I will hopefully show you some examples that at least this um, dichotomy between these two different paths isn't quite so clear-cut as you might think. The discussion is quite old, it's not novel. Um, so here's Charles Bonnet, a Swiss naturalist who lived from 1720 to 1793. And Charles Bonnet had the following to say about self-organization in the bee colony and the, the possibility of how one might construct something as marvelous as the um, hexagonal structure of a honeycomb shown here on the bottom left. He said this, place together in the same room 10,000 automatons animated with a living force and all induced through the perfect resemblance of their outer and inner being. If we admit the least degree of feeling in these automatons, even only such as is necessary for them to be conscious of their own existence, seek their own conservation, avoid noxious things, prepare useful things, etc., their work will not only be regular, well-proportioned, similar, equal, but it will also have symmetry, strength, convenience to the highest point of perfection. So it's interesting here that Bonnet sees the idea of there being a consciousness and feelings sort of as something primitive, as something given, but he still calls them automatons and thinks that somehow by just putting all of these conscious automatons together in the same room, something as magnificent as this honeycomb structure might arise just naturally. Now, I do not think that it's quite so simple. Of course, there have been quite a few crude human experiments in stuffing 10,000 animals together in the same room, as you can see in this chicken battery farm. And for some reason, something as regularly structured as a honeycomb or any form of architecture clearly does not emerge just by itself. So you need a little more than just uh, stuffing lots of animals, perhaps conscious animals, together in the same room to arrive at any form of animal architecture. So many people have mused that there is something remarkable about this extremely regular construction of Honeycomb, you can see a honeycomb under construction. Here there are 
dozens or hundreds of individuals of bees participating in this process. It's a mathematically perfect solution for honey storage, for brood storage, um, in terms of minimizing materials and space used and so on. It's also double-sided, so on both sides you can store larvae and, and honey and so on. And typically the structure is started at the ceiling of the, the hive and then gradually the bees work their way down until they've reached the bottom. But another Swiss naturalist, François Hubert, um, explored the inner workings of the hive centuries ago and made some very surprising discoveries. So he experimented with glass hives to see what the bees might do inside the hive while they're constructing their beautifully regular honeycombs. And what he found was the first thing that if he introduced a glass ceiling into the hive is that the bees didn't particularly like attaching wax comb to glass. So surprisingly that didn't perturb them much because they simply then inverted the entire construction process 180 degrees. Instead of working their way downward from the ceiling, they built the whole comb as a tower construction starting at the bottom and then gradually working their way up until they'd reached the ceiling. Now, it's still a very repetitive process, but if you'd programmed a robot to do exactly the same as the honeybee does, working down along with gravity, that robot would already fail at this particular challenge unless you told the robot to be able to invert their procedure in its alignment with gravity. But the next experiment was even more surprising. So Hubert, when he discovered this flexibility in bees, then introduced a glass bottom in addition to a glass ceiling. And what he found in that case is that the bees would start on the side wall of the, the hive and extend the comb construction laterally through the cavity that he had provided the bees with. What Hubert did next was the really surprising result. While the construction was in process, so the bees had been ha had built halfway through the cavity, he then put a glass obstacle in the projected path of the growing honeycomb. Okay, so the bees had already built their two-dimensional construction almost or uh, halfway through that cavity, and then suddenly there was an obstacle that the bees would have perceived perhaps if they explored further in the linear direction of the growing honeycomb, found that it must have been suboptimal because what happened was that the bees then, before actually reaching the suboptimal surface, would build a 90 degree kink into the comb and attach it to the nearest sidewall. So they avoided projecting from the geometry of the current um, construction that there might be uh, a suboptimal outcome several days down the line. It takes a long while to build honeycomb. They projected and anticipated, or seemed to have anticipated this suboptimal outcome and took uh, corrective action before it materialized and um, built this uh, strange curve construction. And Hubert, 200 years ago, um, said, I acknowledge that I could not suppress a sentiment of admiration for an action in which the brightest foresight was displayed. So Hubert thought that bees have a kind of master plan, an idea of what the desirable outcome of their comb construction might be like. So the way we nowadays study bee orientation, we have a tool called Harmonic Radar, which is the equipment that you can see rotating here on the right, which contains a dish that sends a signal, which in turn is bounced is sent to a bee and with this so-called transponder the bee bounces it back so the top dish can pick it up and in that way informs us about its location and in that way we can monitor bees orientation from their maiden flight the first time they ever leave the hive to their death essentially and monitor where they've been all their lives and just to um make you appreciate the general challenge. Of course, human-made environments in general, compared to natural environments, are relatively easy to navigate. And that's because we build landmarks, buildings that are meant to be unique and memorable. 
If, on the other hand, you consider the typical bees environment, so here is a typical bees environment, then what you see that everything looks a bit the same. Um, so a typical bees challenge might be that there is a nesting site somewhere under this particular tree, then several kilometers away there might be a location over here where there's good pollen to be had, and another location over there behind that hill um, where there might be particularly good nectar. And so there's a lot more similarity between perhaps familiar landmarks than there is in any kind of city. So if you've ever navigated an environment like this without a map or without satnavs or without help from others, then you can sort of appreciate the challenge that um, navigating in insects face in natural environments. And so what we can do with our fancy radar equipment is we can essentially take the view from the cockpit of a bee and see how she sees the world as she's navigating around her environment. So this is actually a reconstructed bee view from one of our radar tracks. You can see here the, um, the slightly boomerang shaped um, eyes of the, the bee and the view through them. So the view is relatively coarse pixeled and a bee sees a lot fewer um, pixels, so to speak, than a human does, but on the other end, um, she can see more rapidly. And the reason why this, these images are very distorted is because bees have pretty much all-round vision. What we can also do in this case is we let the bees to their own devices and um, do not pose them any particular challenges. Instead, we let them roam freely. We let them explore their environment as they see fit and discover flower resources to forage from. So what we see here in green is one individual's maiden flight, the first flight that she's ever made in her life. And you can see that there are various loops in various directions from the hive location, which is marked here in blue. In red, by the way, it's the, the second bee's um, exploration flight. And she flies in various directions. There's a big loop here, and there's another loop there, another loop there. So she flies in a variety of um, directions from the hive, exploring her environment, both to memorize the landscape, as well as perhaps to discover the first few flower patches that um, might be useful for harvesting nectar. Also of importance, we'll later realize why, is that during this first exploration flight, she, ex she flies to this forest, forest edge here once. So that's the bee's first day, two flights, one of them lasted um, about two hours, the second one much shorter. Now this is what the bee does from day two. She makes one more exploratory flight in this direction. There's a single loop here. And then she's discovered a, f uh, a flower patch by the forest edge up um, here. And then for several days, for uh, up to over the, the, the 82nd bout, basically, over several days, she only visits that one location and exploits the flowers there and shuttles back and forth between the hive and this particular foraging location. Nothing but she doesn't visit anything else. This is a complete record of what the bee does. Then there were a few days of inclement weather when the bee stayed at home. And after that, on day 11, she departed again visited the familiar patch from which she'd spent the last few days foraging one more time, then flew back to the hive, flew out to that patch again, and then suddenly changed her mind, it seems, and instead of flying to that um, recently exploited patch, turns her attention entirely to a patch that she'd only visited on her very first foraging flight 10 days earlier, and then spends the rest of her days just visiting that patch. But the most interesting observation here, in a sense to me, is the sudden change of mind on a foraging bout to the patch first exploited, and then halfway through a foraging flight, she, she switches over and retrieves from a distant memory the location of another patch that she just visited once during her early explorations, and then stuck with that until um, during one flight she just disappeared off the radar, presumably having been eaten by a bird or a crab spider.
when I talked to colleagues who work on cognition in primates and corvid birds, they were always a bit dismissive of bees' learning abilities. I told them about how bees can learn colors of flowers and scents and so on, and they said, well, that's what bees do every day in visiting flowers. It's not any evidence for intelligence. And so they were at the time working in on things like string pulling tasks in corvid birds, for example. And at some point, just to be provocative in a lab meeting, I said, well, I bet our bees can solve such a string pulling puzzle and no one quite believed it. But I had a few um, bold postdocs in my lab who were willing to give it a go. And so what you can see in this slide is a task, uh, is a string pulling task in which there are three artificial flowers, each uh, connected to a string and with a central nectar well that a bee would have to get to in order to obtain a reward. And what you can see in this video is the first bee that we ever trained to solve such a task. Here she is landing and now she's found the string and she's pulling it out. She's not landing on the top of the flower. She clearly is, is not necessarily efficient at it, but she knows what she's doing and that she has to pull that string and, um, and remove it from under the glass table to get an access to a reward. Not only can bees learn to, um, to pull um, strings by us gradually telling them, they can also learn it by observing each other. So in this video here, we have two bees, one marked with a red dot, and that's an experienced individual that has done it before, and a completely naive bee who has no idea what she's doing. And you can see that the experienced individual with the red dot pulls out the, the flower, and then they both um, imbibe the um, sugar solution to, together. And then the inexperienced bee simply scrounges on the abilities of the experienced demonstrator. And then after a while, uh, you can see now they're getting a bit um, nervous because um, actually the, the flower, the nectar droplet has been depleted, there's nothing in, and the red marked experience bee just runs over to the next flower and, uh, and, and pulls it out. This one still um, tries, there must be something more here, let me see if I can find it. Now she's running over, scrounging again on the experienced bee's efforts, and this will continue until they've pulled all the four of them out. Um, but if you repeat this process multiple times, then the observer bees will actually learn to pick up the technique and solve it by themselves. Not only that, here the bees of course interact directly with one another, but you can even lock up the observer bee in a little glass um, cage, so to speak, and just let it view the trained demonstrator from a distance. And even from such distant observations, can the observers learn the correct technique to pull a string. So in the next slide, we can see one dot for each individual bee. So at the top there is number 31, that's the, the first demonstrator bee. And in this video, we can see how the technique of string pulling spreads through an entire colony. So you can see there are little lines appearing. Now each of these lines marks one interaction, one pairwise interaction between a trained demonstrator and an observer bee. Moreover, you can see now some of the other dots are turning colored and they turn colored when the interaction has resulted in the demonstrator being able to solve the task by herself. And so now there's a good number of bees that have all been trained by yellow 31 at the top there, and all the ones that have turned orange actually can do it by themselves. And as this goes on, there are now interactions between bees who are not the generation one learner. So here now is a, a, a purple bee, that, and that color tell, marks that this bee has not learned the technique from the original trained demonstrator, but a second generation bee. And as this process continues, more and more bees, here's another purple bee now, learn the technique from second generation demonstrators. And in fact, as the process continues and gradually all bees learn the technique, ultimately even the original demonstrator 
passes away and the, the technique continues spreading through the colony. So there are, is, in the end, a whole colony of string-pulling foragers. So there is a kind of cultural spread of this string-pulling technique through an entire bee colony. For the next experiment, I will let Jane Goodall do the introduction. The most recent uh, example which blows people's minds is the bumblebee. And the bumblebee has been taught to roll a little ball. He rolls it backwards. He rolls the little ball until he can push it down, or maybe she, I don't know, into a, a hole, like a goal. And as soon as this little ball gets into the goal, the bumblebee is given a little drop of nectar as a reward. So they learn to do this. But the mind-blowing thing is other bumblebees who've merely watched a taught bumblebee can do the same without being taught, just by watching. And that is supposed to be a mark of very superior intelligence. So this is something we're learning all the time. We have been far too arrogant. The animal kingdom of which we are a part is filled with secrets. And gosh, I'd love to be young and learning about these things now because all the doors are wide open and you never know what you're going to find. So the task, as Jane Goodall just explained, is to move the ball, in this case, from the periphery to the center of this horizontal area. And once the ball arrives in the center, the bee gets a sugar reward. So they can be trained to do that just fine. But the reason why the social learning by observation in this task is so particularly remarkable is this. So what we can see in this slide um, is a task with two bumblebees. Here is an experienced bee that has already solved the task before. That's our so-called demonstrator. And then there's an observer which has never solved that task before. So she's entirely naive. And when the two bees get together, this is what happens. If you um, so you can see here the experienced bee rolling the ball to the center, and then they both get a little sugar droplet as a reward. Now, obviously, the logical way to solve this task, if all you need to do is to get a ball into the center, would be to pick the closest ball um, that's closest to the target area and move that to um, the center. But we've played a little trick. The experienced bee, the one that you've just seen roll the ball into the center, actually knows that the two closest balls, this one and that one, cannot be moved because they're glued down. So that bee knows I have to pick the furthest ball, so the least optimal one, to move to the target area. And so for three times, the naive observer gets to see that. It gets to see the, the demonstrator bee use the furthest ball moving it into the central target area. So what we see in this slide now is the observer being alone. This observer has seen the demonstrator solve the task three times, and every time the demonstrator used the furthest ball. Now the observer is on her own. Will she pick the same furthest ball, or will she solve the task in a better way and pick the closest ball? and she picks the closest ball. So she's not simply copying the demonstrator exactly. She actually seems to have a form of understanding of what is the desired outcome of her actions. And rather than simply aping the demonstrator, she picks the optimal ball to solve the task. OK, so our next question is, can bees picture things? Can they imagine things such as a flower's shape and so on? Now, bees are, of course, famously good at recognizing flower patterns, but it's actually surprisingly difficult to find out whether there is such a thing as a mental representation of a flower, even if an insect recognizes it, because often it turns out
It can be that flower patterns can be recognized with simple feature detectors that analyze edge orientation and so on. So in our following experiment, we asked if bees can actually draw on a representation of a particular shape through multiple different sensory modalities, which would be more of an indication of a mental representation of shape than just recognizing a shape in the visual modality. So what we did initially is we trained the bees to distinguish two different shapes, balls and cubes, but in this case they could not touch them. They could only see them through a plexiglass lid and one of the shapes, in this case the ball, was associated with reward, that means a little reward of sugar, sugar solution, and the other, in this case the cubes, was not. And then the same bees that were trained in this manner were now presented with the same shapes in complete darkness, where they couldn't see at all, but in this case they were allowed to touch these different shapes. And in this case, when the bees had first been trained to see and be rewarded over balls that however they could not touch in the light, then if the same bees were tested in complete darkness, then they chose the balls over the cubes only using the touch modality. So, so they could recognize the same object in a different sensory modality. And we then also reversed this experiment where we first exposed the bees to the same shapes in complete darkness as shown in this photograph here. We used infrared light of course to monitor the bee's behavior and you can see that the bee here is, is sort of hugging the ball while she's imbibing the sugar solution reward. The cube in this case was unrewarding. And then in the same manner we switched the situation to one in which they could no longer rely on the touch modality but on vision. However, again in this particular experiment the bees could not touch the shapes as they had during training but only see them. And sure enough, the bee again, after being trained to a round shape in darkness, when she faced the same shapes in the light, picked the balls over the cubes. So in both of these scenarios, they picked the correct object in a different sensory modality, from which we conclude from this kind of flexible axis through different sensory modality, that indeed there must be a kind of mental representation of the shape of an object. Do insects have emotions? Charles Turner did at least take this possibility seriously. I invite you all to read the papers of this man. He lived from 1867 to 1923. He was a, an entomologist as well as a psychologist and his literature is extremely rich with visionary ideas that unfortunately have been largely forgotten today. But it's remarkable also that he actually did consider the possibility of these digger wasps having emotions. So this is a photograph by him from one of his papers in 1912 and he writes this, the coiled antenna, the protruding mouth parts and the general attitude indicate intense excitement. One who believes that insects have emotions will find much in the attitude of these two Ammophilas to support his view. Now Turner was aware that this was merely an observation, it was not an experimental exploration. He has very rigorous experiments in many of his other papers, which I would strongly encourage you to read. But how might one test emotions in insects experimentally and quantitatively? Well, we chose to use a paradigm that is simply borrowed from vertebrate research. It is basically asking whether an animal's or an individual's glass is half full or half empty, as symbolized in this little um, photograph here. So an optimist would judge this ambiguous situation as being glass half full, and the pessimist faced with exactly the same situation would say it is half empty. And so you can actually test 
um, animals' emotional states by asking them the same kind of question in ambiguous situations. And that sort of task that I'm just going to explain is used exactly in the same kind of manner in domestic animals, for example, to find out whether um, they're happy domestic animals or unhappy ones. So what did we do? We have a little flight arena, as you can see there on top, and the bee has five options, either to pick the leftmost options, option marked in purple, or the right marked in green. And there's only ever one option available, so it's a so-called go, no-go task. And what the um, animal learns over time is that whenever the blue left option is available, there is a reward. Whenever the green right option is available, there is no reward. And after this training, the bee is then faced with various intermediate ambiguous options, such as turquoise or greenish turquoise or bluish turquoise. And we're then asking, well, do you judge this more likely as being a positive outcome? Might the glass be half full or a negative one? Is it unrewarding in this case? So here's the training in simple forms, what the bee does when uh, she's learned that that um, the, the blue left option is rewarding, she flies there in a straight line. If, on the other hand, the green option is presented, the bee already knows, well, this isn't any good. She faffs about for a great um, deal of time and then finally says, well, okay, I might as well go and try it. But she takes a much longer delay time before accepting an option that she already knows as being unrewarding. The question then is, what happens with the ambiguous intermediate option? So here is a turquoise one. And again, when we um, present the bee with the turquoise option, we then measure the delay time that it takes her to accept that option. And interestingly, that delay time depends on something that happened before this experiment. It depends on whether we gave the bee a little sucrose um, droplet as a surprise. So here she gets five microliters of a surprise droplet of sucrose in the run-up to the experiment before she even enters the arena and in the control group she um, gets nothing. And it turns out that the way the bee judges this ambiguous situation, turquoise, depends on what happened before she even started the experiment. And that's shown in this graph on the right side here. So when the bees face their familiar rewarding option, that's P on the right, the delay time is invariably very short. They fly straight there. If, on the other hand, the, um, the green right option is shown, that's shown on the right here, invariably the bees will delay for quite some time before accepting that option. But for all the ambiguous options, so turquoise being in the middle, there is a difference depending on what happened before the experiment. So if the bees before starting the experiment had their little surprise reward, ooh, there's a sweet that I've never seen here before, they tend to accept the ambiguous option faster, that's our red line here, than they would otherwise. So if there was a surprise reward before the experiment, the bees accept the intermediate option more rapidly. So they behave in this glass half full, glass half empty, in this ambiguous situation more optimistically if they've had a surprise reward before entering the experiment. And you can do, of course, the same with adverse stimuli, in which case the bee will behave in the opposite way. So there is, by the same criteria, by which we judge mammals, domestic animals, as being emotionally biased in either a positive or a negative direction, by the same criteria, bees could be judged to have simple emotional states. Now, a final question might be whether insect brains aren't just too small to contain anything such as a mind. Aren't they just too simple? too undifferentiated. And undoubtedly, bee brains are extremely small, you know, the size of a bee head. And of course, the brain is substantially smaller than that, roughly one cubic millimeter. And indeed, they contain relatively few neurons, certainly compared to the 80 billion that 
a human might have. So roughly 850,000 neurons in a bee's brain. Here is a portrait of a frontal view of a bee's brain. In so even though insect brains are small and the numbers of neurons are few, they are by no means simple. So here is the structure of a single neuron in a bee's brain. And you can see that it's about as finely branched as a fully grown oak tree. Extremely wide ramifications through all regions of the brain, including the antennal lobes and the mushroom bodies and so on. That is just a single neuron. And it turns out that this neuron largely constitutes the reward pathway in the bee's brain. So each single such neuron might make connections with perhaps 10,000 other neurons. And from that, you can deduce that there is an extremely finely grained and, um, and detailed neural network across the bee brain. If you ask computer scientists how many neurons you need for consciousness-like phenomena, such as predicting outcomes of one, one's own actions, and it's diminutively small, perhaps 10,000, compared to even um, a bee's brain. There is at least some suggestive evidence to indicate that insect brains might support consciousness. One comes from the neurobiology of a central complex, whose most important and well-described role is in navigation but it also integrates information from external stimuli, internal states such as motivation and past experiences and could thus represent a kind of neural model of the familiar space around the insect as well as of the self, as for example suggested by Baron and Klein in a 2016 PNAS paper. In the same vein, some jewel wasps, parasitoid insects, sting cockroaches into the vicinity of the central complex. And this has the effect of turning them into something like behavioral zombies that have still got reflexes and they can still walk, but they lack any form of self-initiated action as might be generated by a will, for example. Interestingly also, Bruno von Swinderen's team has shown that analogous to vertebrates, insects have several types of brain waves that correlate with the state of wakefulness or sleep. Several sleep phases are also well described by such brain waves. And crucially, more synchronized brain waves across brain areas occur in awake states, perhaps facilitating the kind of cross-modal cognition that we've heard about earlier. And finally, there are neural correlates of attention. Attention is a form of inner eye focusing selectively on certain stimuli, but not others. And th these investigations also show showed brain states that precede the bee's selection of one or another stimulus. That's also work from Bruno von Swinderen's lab. So insect brains are not simple, and I think not too simple to contain a mind. Finally, some broader conclusions, that there are mental explorations of solutions to possible um, problems, and that there are sorts of emotional states, at least by the same criteria as we diagnose them in large brain mammals, that there are emotional states that, um, that we can diagnose and that we should perhaps explore whether there are even emotions that we don't know in other animals, such as that might be linked to unique bee minds, unique bee problems, such as the discovery of a nectar-rich flower or the swarming process when honeybees move from one hive to the next. And finally, I think it's important to consider the ethical implications of such research, um, the possibility that there is a mind to be suffering in bees. And I think that is important for how we consider their conservation, as well as thinking about how we treat animals in research laboratories. And so in that vein, I'll play you a little song with my band, The Killer Bee Queens. The song is called The Beekeeper's Dream, and it's loosely inspired by Patricia Highsmith's The Snail Watcher, about a person whose pets invade their owner's nightmares. <laughs> 
Of course, the song doesn't literally have to be about a beekeeper. It could also be about a scientist tormented by ethical concerns about what he does to his animals in the laboratory. The material for the music video is taken from David Blair's surrealist masterpiece, Wax, or the discovery of television among the bees. The first film ever aired on the internet. I heavily recommend it. Anyway, enjoy the music. I knew which way to go. Into the darkness. They know my face, they know what I have done. I stole a nerdy quick heart again. Year after year after year after year after year. Thank you very much for your attention. We've got really uh, a lot of questions uh, for you, Lars. Um, I just hope that uh, we can get to a reasonable number of them. I'm sorry. Uh, apologies to anybody whose question uh, we don't manage uh, to get to. So, um, 
I'll just start off with one of the very early questions that was asked, uh, Lars. It was, this is a question uh, about the foraging or slides that you showed at the beginning when you showed the tracks uh, of the bee changing uh, from 11 days onward. And the question is, is from Jim Monag, and it, the question is, uh, could this be due to a change in the availability of food? And he's thinking in also that maybe the change could be due uh, to some transfer of information within the hive, either by the bees uh, regurgitating for each other, or of course by the waggle dance itself, which might transmit information. Sure. Just briefly, it seems that the host has turned off my video, so I can't currently show myself. So yes, it, it's um, quite possible that any sort of change in allegiance to a plant species or a particular flower patch is because the reward offerings have on. changed. So in general, bees are careful shoppers in the flower supermarket and adjust their preferences all the time. So the remarkable thing in this particular case was that <laughs> the bee appeared to, um, okay, thank you. Um, the, the bee appeared to um, change its mind halfway through a flight towards uh, flying to a patch that she had only visited like 10 days earlier without actually retracing any familiar route but apparently retrieving the information entirely from, from memory. That is the, the remarkable observation there. In bumblebees, unlike honeybees, there is no communication about location. So honeybees have a very elaborate uh, spatial communication system by which they can alert hive mates to the precise distance and direction of a um, a food source using a very highly ritualized motor display, if you wish. Bumblebees don't do that. Bumblebees can communicate that there currently is food somewhere in the environment, but they do so without passing on any, any um, information about location. So since this particular bee that we tracked through its entire lifetime was a bumblebee, it's not conceivable that she would have picked up that information in the hive. And moreover, the change of track was not initiated in the hive, but while the bee was in flight to another familiar patch. Thank you. Uh, and another question is about the string pulling task, uh, whether um, there's variation in how quickly individuals learn this task and, and what that variation might be due to. Yeah. So for every task where we measure individual variation, we also find it. There are some individuals that are especially quick at picking up on such tasks and others very slow. So specifically in the, the string pulling task, we trained and tested way over a hundred individuals. And th th there were only two individuals of all the ones we tested that figured it out entirely by themselves. All the other ones required stepwise training, either by observation of other um, informed bumblebees or by us in a, step, in a stepwise training procedure where we had to gradually push the, the blue disc under the glass platform. There were just two individuals that did, did it spontaneously. When we measure such um, variation in learning abilities, there are not just individual effects, there are also between colony effects. So colonies are families essentially because they share the same father and mother in, um, in bumblebees. And um, so there are some colonies that are especially swift at learning colors, scents and other tasks, um, other features of flowers whereas others are spectacularly slow at such tasks. Okay, and, and while we're on variation in, in learning speed, there was a question that I had. Of course, all these workers are females. Correct. Um, and so I was wondering if the male bees, the drones, who don't really seem to do very much at all, 
uh, are they poor learners or can they learn anything? Yes, they can. Um, so there are some between species differences in honeybees, uh, the males are indeed spectacularly incapable of doing anything much but mating. Um, they even have to be fed by by workers because they can't um, feed themselves. But even in um, in the the male honeybee, they do remember their home, so they have to navigate successfully to mating sites where they meet with queens and then find their way back. So they're still. Um, they still have to have a very good spatial memory. Um, in bumblebees, however, males also visit flowers, so they have to remember which flowers are the best, the most rewarding ones, and the colors and the scents. And we actually did some color learning experiments with, um, with uh, bumblebee males, and surprisingly, they were actually as quick at picking up the contingencies between colors and rewards as were workers. So they're not, not as dense as one might think. <laughs> Good to know that. Um, a couple of questions in connection with the consciousness issue and the possible emotional states. Um, one question is, might, uh, is there any sign of any dream-like states in bees in connection with sleep? Um, and if they can be said to have consciousness, uh, could we say they had free will? That's a very interesting question. Um, so, the, I mean, it's very hard to know if any animal is dreaming. There is some interesting evidence, for example, from um, rodents, where people record simultaneously from many dozens of nerve cells while the animal is both awake and navigating a spatial environment and then um, a, um, then they can still record from the same brain cells during the night and it seems indeed that these rodents replay spatial experiences from the day before we don't have that level of um, um, recordings in bees in part because we can't um, or people cannot do neurophysiological recordings very easily from freely moving animals. There are, however, there is evidence for various sleep phases in bees and other insects, including deep sleep phases and, and something equivalent to REM sleep in, um, in um, humans. And Bruno van Swindern especially has done quite a bit of work on on um, on fruit flies and the and um, and brain oscillations in various parts and they seem to be in certain sleep phases very close to to actual awake states so it is plausible in that sense that there might be something like uh, dreamlike states perhaps similarly to mammalians serving memory consolidation during sleep but we don't know this yet I guess that was one half of the question. Remind me what the other half was. The other half was about free will. Okay. Um, that's also an, a very interesting question. Um, that was actually um, first also discussed by, by Charles Turner in his case, um, using cockroaches running mazes in where he saw them pause and, um, um, and seemingly decide what to do next. And he, he thought that was an indication of them pondering various different options and, um, and ultimately choosing which ones. There is a very good, more recent paper by Björn Brems on um, the adaptive significance of free will as a kind of evolutionary trait. Um, and he thinks that uh, many um, animals have it and that it is also adaptive to be deciding between available options to, um, to be able to mentally explore solutions and then form an adaptive decision. And he includes insects in these, in his discussion. Martin Heisenberg has also written about this topic. Um, and then another, another question in, while we're on uh, consciousness and learning and so on. Um, have you tried uh, measuring how long it takes bees to forget things? 
Yes, um, hardly anything is ever fully forgotten. So we did, um, and that, that applies to, to other animals as well. So we did experiments on motor learning a long time ago where bees had to, to, manip to manipulate different artificial flower types in which sometimes they had to twist their bodies to the right side or to the left side and also link these motor patterns to colors and so on. Bees only live for a few weeks, so um, three to four weeks, um, sometimes a bit longer in, um, in, in laboratory environments, but we trained these bees and really tested them three weeks later. And while there were um, over these three weeks were a lot poorer in their performance than at the end of training, they were still better than a completely naive animal and they were also better than they themselves had been three weeks earlier. So while these memories seem to have to some extent faded when you prodded them again, hey, do you remember this? They actually performed better than before. And you find similar things in, in human memories often. So especially motor memories where if you um, put someone again on ice skates at, skates at age 50, when the last time they did it were, was 30 years ago, they might say, oh my God, I can't do this. And once they're actually on the ice, um, well, they, they're, they're surprised themselves how, how much they actually do remember. So there's that. Um, we also did some work on um, not forgetting, but misremembering so that um, bees actually had, had false memories of flower types they encountered. And we did that by sequentially training them to various flower types and then exposing them to flowers they'd never seen before, but which bore elements of flower features they had encountered in separate incidents. And they then preferred flowers with these combined features from past memories to the individual ones they had actually been rewarded on. So there was a kind of false memory where they merged features of different things that they had seen in the past. Right, and then uh, do, does the learning performance decline with age? No, it, we, we have tried in a number of different tasks to find any age effects and we never found anything. Now again, um, bees live a very short period, um, so there might not simply be enough time to senesce and become um, and, and have declined memory performance because I guess other systems fail before their brains do. Um, but no, we have never found any age effect on cognitive performance. And then there are some questions uh, about emotions. Um, uh, could you perhaps define emotion and are there any ways of measuring it outside of the learning context? Yes, so with, um, with any animal, of course, the access to any non-human animal, um, the access to emotional states is only indirect. So we can't, of course, in the same way as with a human, ask them, hey, are you a little sad today? Um, or, or, are you, or whether um, they are um, upbeat or, um, and so on. So we, we have to always use some sort of indirect measure. And there are various ways of going about that. One is to use the kind of standardized psychological tests that we used and which are also employed for domestic animals to ascertain whether they're, um, they're, they're happy pigs or uh, chickens or goats um, or not in their um, farmer's environment, for example. Um, another way of going about this is to evaluate hormonal states. And of course, you can also measure various brain states. We don't do that in, in our laboratory. So we use mostly psychological measures. Um, others use also physiological or neurophysiological um, measures. Um, but in, in, in our behavioral psychological world, at least the bees by the same criteria by which you, for example, diagnose pessimistic or optimistic um, psychological states qualify. So if, if you reject these criteria, then by analogy, you would also have to reject them in, in goats and, and, um, and um, primates. Mm. 
because they're equally indirect there. Of course. Um, there's also a question about whether bees uh, might have the ability to distinguish food sources that are, uh, for example, being sprayed with pesticides uh, from those which haven't. Uh, is, there, is there any work on that kind of thing going on, that the cognitive ability of the bee might overcome the toxins that are being applied in the environment? Well, it's, that's very tricky because um, the neonicotinoids, for example, that are common insecticides are, are in, heavy, in the heaviest concentration, of course, in, in the leaves where they're meant to deter or kill herbivores. They leak in, in very low concentrations into the nectar as well, so that bees are exposed to them and will carry them home to their colonies and there are documented detrimental effects. And at these low concentrations, uh, the, the foraging bees that visit the flowers certainly seem not to discriminate against them. There is even some evidence that they um, that in these low concentrations they moderately prefer them, and they, they might in fact act in a similar kind of way as as nicotine does, which um, at low concentrations um, can not just induce addiction like phenomena, but can also actually um, assist in in associative learning, facilitating associating the floral features with reward um, so that the that the bees might actually be drawn to flowers that contain these toxins toxins so it's quite a dangerous scenario they, they, do, they do not seem to um, close the full loop of realizing aha there's some harmful effect um, going on in our colony if I carry this stuff home on the contrary there's they're either neutral about it or they might, there is actually evidence that they um, preferentially collect such nectar Okay, and then there's also um, a, a couple of questions in connection with the difference between solitary bees and, and you know, the colonial hive forming bees. Uh, is there a difference in their learning capacities? And might there be any collective consciousness of bees in the hive that uh, okay. could be studied in some way? Right. So in your you're right the, the vast majority and many people don't know this so it's worth highlighting the vast majority of bee species tens of thousands of bee species are actually solitary not social um, these bees however share with the social bees the fact that they all have brood care so they um, they they feed their young they have nests whose locations they must remember and they must of course also forage adaptively that means remember good flower patches and so on so some of the requirements on spatial memory on flower memory and so on are shared by by the the social um, and the solitary bee species and one would not necessarily expect the solitary species to be therefore less intelligent if you wish although they lack of course the kind of communication systems and social coordination of nest construction that you find in in the social mm -hmm. bee. Is there a kind of sorry? No, carry on, carry on. Is there a kind of social consciousness? Um, I don't think so. So um, there, there, just like in humans, there are very impressive things that bees in social settings can do together, but there are still in humans as many individual consciousness as there are consciousnesses as there are individuals participating in joint endeavors such as the construction of of a city or a home and so on there is no that I mean, people sometimes have the sense that because insects so beautifully cooperate in um, constructions like uh, termite mounds or or um, honeycombs that um, that there is some sort of mysterious joint consciousness, but I, I mean, we're still, of course, at a debating stage of whether even individual bees have consciousness. I think the probability is likely, but I don't think there is a kind of conscious experience of being the swarm or the, the group of bees. Okay, there's a few questions. People are interested in the waggle dance. 
Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, its role in communication amongst the beasts, but also uh, on whether the dance is learned or, and, and is it the same for all colonial bees or is the nature of the dance different? Are there local variants, for example, of the dance? Yes, that's a good question. So um, there are about a dozen species of honeybees, all of the ones that are um, that are not the Western hive bee that's been um, distributed through the, the Americas and so on, um, live originally in, in Asia. And they all have the waggle dance, while all the other bees that are non honeybees, so bumblebees, stingless bees, all the solitary bees, do not have this dance language. There are differences in the dance language between honeybee species, and it seems also. Um, between um, between local varieties of um, the Western hypey, there also seem to be some subtle differences. However, the basic features in all of these species are the same. So the basic features are that there is a, a very recognizable motor display where the dancing bee, I should perhaps briefly explain how the, the waggle dance works because not everyone knows this. So um, what you see if you look into the darkness of the hive with um, infrared light or um, um, by, by some other means is that on the vertical honeycomb you see some individuals that have recently discovered a good food source run in a straight line for a few centimeters, then they run around in a half circle, then another straight line, then another half circle, another straight line, another half circle and so on. So it's a figure eight shaped display and the duration of this straight ahead run, um, the longer that is, the further away is the food. And the angle of that, that uh, waggle run indicates to other bees the, the direction of the food source relative to the sun. So to the extent that if the waggle run is straight up inside the hive, that tells other bees fly to the sun. If it's straight down, it tells other bees fly away from the sun. And um, if it's 90 degrees to the right of the direction of gravity inside the hive, that means to other bees fly to 90 degrees to the right of the sun. So this basic figure eight shaped design is common to all species of honeybees. But there are some more subtle differences in terms of just how much duration of waggle run corresponds to which distance. And there are also some honeybee species where this whole dance is performed on a horizontal, not a vertical surface and so on. So there are some subtle differences. Um, it seems that this um, behavior is largely innate. So all bees can do it without further encouragement or training and, all, and bees can also understand um, the waggle dance without the need for being trained in it. However, there's been some fascinating uh, work um, where people have merged two different species of honeybees that have two different distance codes. So that let's say one centimeter of waggle run means, means flying 1.2 kilometers away from the hive in one species and only 800 meters in another species. So they should misunderstand each other. But it seems that over time of mixing these two species together, they can actually learn to read each other's uh, waggle dances so that apparently there must be some recalibration perhaps bees of the wrong species initially overshoot the target find okay but I, I must have misread that and then zero in on the correct location perhaps after some search and then recalibrate their reading of that other species down so there is there can be some learning evolved even uh, involved even in this largely hard, hardwired routine Okay, and, and when we're now that we're on the hardwired issues, uh, there's also quest some questions about the genetics uh, and whether there might, for example, be differences among inherited differences amongst colonies in the speed of learning and the learning capabilities. Are there really fast learning colonies and slow learning colonies, for example? Yes, um, so there are in, in bumblebees, we have done experiments where we measured multiple individuals per colonies learning speed and then also 
um, took after we had done these laboratory experiments, took the same bee colonies and let them forage in the wild. And it turned out that the faster learning ones were also superior in their foraging performance at natural flowers. There are other researchers, Rob Page from the University of Arizona, for example, who have analyzed the genetics of um, learning speed in this case in honeybee colonies. And it turns out that it is strongly heritable. Okay, uh, we're sort of running out of time, uh, Lars, but I'll give you uh, one uh, last question from a beekeeper uh, who says that uh, he, this beekeeper has been struck by a growing impression that honeybees recognize their beekeeper. And the question is, do you think that's just wishful thinking and imagination on the part of the beekeeper? Or do you think this could be possible? It is at least plausible. So we did an, a slightly tongue in cheek experiment um, 15 years ago where we trained um, bees to recognize black and white images of human faces. In fact, we took a, a, test, a test set of photos used to diagnose a condition called prosopagnosia in humans, so the, the uh, uh, disorder where people can't recognize individual faces. And uh, the bees were perfectly good at this task and learned to associate these images of, of human faces with rewards. So it is possible whether indeed bees can recognize a, a human individual um, like that in, in three dimensions and life we haven't tested yet, but it's not impossible. Okay, I, I, I just apologize to the other people who put in questions that, that unfortunately we don't have time uh, to answer. So before drawing uh, things uh, to a close, um, uh, I'd also just like to remind people that the next talk on, is on the 10th of February and it will be given by, by Misha Glenny and the title is The Human Scale Technology and leadership in times of crisis. Lars, uh, I'm sure people are absolutely astonished by the cognitive capacities of bees and, and also by the musical ability of a bee scientist. <laughs> uh, so, and, and it was very good of you to make the, the video for us. It was very nice and it was dramatic. I know we had to sort out a few things at the beginning to make sure we could show it as, as well as we can. So thank you so much on behalf of the society and its members and those who've joined who aren't members. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Thank and you so much for inviting me. It was very kind. Thank you very much. All right. Have a nice evening, everyone. And you. Bye.